please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. Please be seated. Thank you. 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 Thank Beloved wife, mother, stepmother, grandmother, and sister of our dear friend Tom Tell Sr. and aunt. Our friend Andrew Ivanish, devoted husband, brother, uncle, World War II Navy veteran, and philanthropist who installed the train at Naog Park among his numerous contributions to local communities. Robert J. Mayer, loving son, cousin, friend, and retired member of the Scranton Police Department. Robert Barron, devoted husband, father, grandfather, brother, uncle, and friend. Dorothy Halliburta, beloved wife, mother, grandmother of Scranton Lips Director Mark Seitzinger, great-grandmother, step-great-grandmother, and sister, and their dear families and friends who suffer their loss. Roll call, please. Mr. McGough? Here. Mr. Rogan? Here. Mr. Lascom? Here. Mr. Joyce? Here. Mrs. Evans? Here. Dispense with the reading of the minutes, please. Third Order 3A, minutes of the Composite Pension Board meeting held on Wednesday, April 23rd, 2013. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3B, minutes of the Scranton Police Pension Meeting held April 24, 2013. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3C, controller's report for the month ending April 30, 2013. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. Do we have any clerk's notes this evening, Mrs. Craig? No, Mrs. Evans. Thank you. Do any council members have announcements at this time? Just one. Um, the Southside Neighborhood Watch Community Day will be held on June 1st from 12, to 12 noon to 3 p.m. in the state's St. Stanislaus Church parking lot located on the corner of East Elm and Pittston. And again, that's June 1st from noon till 3 p.m. Is there anyone else? The Lackawanna River Corridor Association will conduct its annual River Fest this Saturday, June 1st, 2013, including a canoe-a-thon, kayak excursions, a regatta, and a duck-a-thon. For additional information, call 570-347-6311 or go to www.lrca.org. Don't miss this fun-filled family event. And that's it. Fourth Order Citizens Participation. Our first speaker tonight is Bill Jackowitz. Good evening. <coughs> Good evening, Scranton City Council. Good evening. Good evening. Bill Jackowitz, South Scranton resident member of the Taxpayer Association. Recently, my standing as a speaker at this forum and the facts that I have presented was questioned. I am a retired Air Force veteran with 20 years of active duty honorable service and can prove it. My taxes are paid up and current. I am a resident of the city of Scranton. My family has resided in Scranton for over 100 years. If you check out the county courthouse, you will see my father's name on two monuments, the General Kosciuszko Monument on Spruce Street and the General uh, uh, Pulaski's Monument on the corner of Linden Street and Adams Avenue. I have been co-chairperson for the Kids Swim Free Program 
and have successively conducted approximately 15 swim events at Nayog Park. Paying for children 15 and under to swim free using the monies that have been donated by the local businessmen and private citizens. While others have sat back and only talked about it, I did it. Those, those facts that I present each week are not mine. They are data produced by the Pennsylvania Economy League, the City Administration, City Council, Scranton Tax Office, Business Administrator, State Department of Labor and Industry, U.S. Census, local news report, plus national and international news reports, attendance at court hearings, and listening to testimonies and rulings from the bench, and finally, in, and the experts, and, and experts in the field of municipal finance. Unfortunately, these reports are not always positive news, as a matter of fact. Mostly they are negative reports based upon the fact that the city of Scranton has been distressed for 21, 21 and a half years with no solution on how to get out of the distressed city status. Furthermore, the financial evidence points to bankruptcy, Municip municipality, poverty level in Scranton, 31.5%. One family out of every three families living in Scranton live in poverty. I present, I present them in the hope that the administration, city council, and the Pennsylvania Economy League will seek to correct the sins of the past and improve the reputation and living conditions for all Scranton residents and taxpayers. I have also been accused of threatening, bullying, and calling city council members' names from this podium. I ask each of the council members and council staff members, is this a truthful and factual statement? Mr. McGough? Yes. Mr. Rogan? No. Mrs. Evans? Yes. Mr. Joyce? No, you've never called me a name. Mr. Loskin? No. Ms. Ms. Craig? Nancy? Would you please repeat what you just said? Uh, yeah, I have been accused of calling uh, city council, council members' names and bullying them from this uh, uh, po uh, podium. And I'm just wondering if that's true or not, if that's an accurate statement. If you've called councilmen names, that's yes. your question? Yes. Or bullying them. Or bullying them? Harassing them. And you want to know how, if I feel you've done that? Yeah, I'm just asking, is it yes or no? Yes or no? I, th I think it's too ambiguous a question because it's determining how they feel about your remarks. And I can't really speak on anyone's feelings. I can okay. speak on my well, own. What about your feelings? On my feelings, yes, sometimes I've been offended, but it is your right to do that. Okay, uh, Attorney Hughes? I would think that whether it's offensive or if any council person interprets it that, and obviously there are a few council, council persons that do, from their standpoint, um, it's, it's subjective. Um, I think that if you did, you'd be called out of order. Um, maybe called okay, out of order. I have order. never been called out of order. No, but I said maybe you would be yes called or, out of order. but yes or no answer? I can't answer it yes or no. But okay. I think, we'll I think sometimes your comments are, you know, to some council persons are a little, a little offensive, in okay. my opinion. That's, thank you. Uh, my disagreement with the seven elected officials of Scranton and the Pennsylvania Economy League should not and does not in any way represent bullying, intimidation, or, or disrespect for anyone. It only represents my displeasure with the way Scranton elected officials conduct Scranton business. My belief and understanding is that elected officials are elected to work for the people. I hold all elected officials accountable to the people. I do not always agree with the mayor and city council. This is my right as a citizen, veteran, and taxpayer to agree or disagree. I also have the right to express my opinion at any time, and I will, uh, and I will. You can either agree or disagree with my opinion. That is your right. There is more to government than taxes. How about financial management of the, of the tax money that has been generated and spending restraints by the elected officials and city administration? Government should not be a popularity contest. Some will run away from dangers. Others will run toward the danger to help save lives and ensure freedom for all. This is why they are called war fighters and first responders. Without these people, those who, who run the opposite direction would be lost. 
Does anybody on City Council have any questions or comments to make before I leave the podium? Thank you. Your time is up. Thank you very much. And our next speaker is Rick Schrader. Good evening. Uh, Good evening. I'm here as the business manager of uh, IBW Local 81, which represents the electricians in the city of Scranton. Office is located at 431 Wyoming Avenue. I want to take a minute to thank council for the opportunity to come up here and to, to voice uh, opinions that I have. Uh, and uh, I also want to thank each and every one of them for the service that they do to the city. Whether anyone agrees or disagrees, certainly. Uh, uh, the service that you do to the city, I think, has to be recognized. For those of you that will be leaving, I thank you for what you've done in the past. For those of you that are staying, certainly look forward to, to working with you in the future. Uh, we, we have uh, a number of people. Uh, we have over 150 members that live in the city of Scranton. I'm here tonight uh, to ask the council to uh, consider accepting the recommendation of the Historical uh, Architectural Review Board for approving the Certificate of Appropriateness for the University of Scranton uh, on Linden Street, uh, 800 Linden Street in, in Scranton here. Uh, the demolition of the, the Leahy Hall and the, uh, a, a new building that will be constructed there. Uh, after talking with people from the University of Scranton, I understand it will be an eight-story building. I think that this building uh, is going to be bigger and better than what is there. Uh, it's going on to a site where the, the building already is not on the tax rolls, and, and I think that, uh, you know, there's always some concern if there's a, a nonprofit. But the fact that it wasn't on the tax rolls, and prior to that being the YWCA wasn't on the tax roll, uh, I think that it's a win-win for, for the city because of the jobs that are going to be created. Certainly I'm speaking here because I represent construction workers that would stand to uh, hopefully work on that project. I think there'll be hundreds of people that will be working there, generating a lot of tax money that, that would be uh, coming into the city. Uh, I think that the utilization of that, where it's going to be a bigger and taller building, uh, the space for the physical and occupational therapy units that will be there, I think is going to be a big plus uh, to us in the community. Uh, I've lived and was grown up in the hill section in Scranton. And I can tell you, I remember the university when there was only a few buildings here. And I've seen it develop into one of the finest institutions of higher learning in the country. I don't think that there's anyone here or anyone in the city that wouldn't be proud to say that they had somebody graduate from the university. I can personally tell you that I had a son that went there, graduated from there, and uh, I'm, I'm very proud to say that he did go there. And, <clears throat> you know, unfortunately, uh, lives in another area now. He's a doctor that lives in another area, but certainly uh, I think that he had uh, some of the opportunities he had because of going there. Uh, so the, some of the, the positive things that the university has done, uh, you know, the university has a, a $404,077,660 regional impact in 2011-2012. Uh, they had an, an economic impact of over five billion dollars since 1980. Uh, there's some staggering numbers here. Uh, the students spend an average of 1.4 million off campus each month. Uh, the community organizations uh, held more than 4,500 events at the University of Scranton since 19 or since 2004. University employees and alumni make up nearly 10 percent of the city's workforce and nearly one in ten city residents are students, alumni, or employees. Uh, last year, the university voluntarily contributed $175,000 to the city uh, and 58000 to Lackawanna County. The university committed $3.16 million to beautify Mulberry Street. So there's a lot of positive things that the university has done. I would hate to think what Scranton would look like without the University of Scranton. I remember the older dilapidated buildings that were there when I used to walk to school every day and walk by the University of Scranton. I think that it could be a win-win, and I certainly ask uh, each one of the council members to uh, consider uh, approving the uh, University of Scranton's uh, plans for, for Linden Street. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank, thank you. you.
Jack figured. Good evening, Council. Good, Good evening, 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 Good evening Janet and Frank. Thank you for your service. Janet, it wasn't that long ago when you were walking through the city streets looking for vo votes with your son, and it doesn't seem to be that long ago anyway. Yeah. I've grayed a little since then and you know, give it a little thing. I'm here to speak on two subjects tonight. I'd like to know if anyone has any information on the Rockwell Avenue Bridge project. Uh, it seems that I went to a meeting about three years ago where there was a design study done. And there was something that was going to happen there, but since then it's fallen off the map, and the road's been closed now for a year, and we don't have anything. You know, the neighborhood doesn't have any indication of what's going on. Does anybody have any update or anything on that? The neighbors know as much as we do, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, we're kept in the dark on a lot of stuff, even though we request information, we still don't receive it. We have passed extra money for the, for the bridge also, but uh, you know, when it comes to that point, that's as far as it goes here. And hopefully that'll change in January. Hopefully, hopefully it will. And <clears throat> hopefully with a new administration and new council members and, you know, it's going to be a tough road to follow. You guys did a great job and thank you for that. I'm also here to speak on the University of Scranton. And like Rick says, that, that building will be an eight-story building. It's going to be a beautiful structure. There is an economic impact to the city, not only in mercantile taxes that the, uh, uh, the builders, the contractors, the architects, the engineers will be paying to that. There's also over $400,000 in permit fees that will be a direct benefit to the city. When we had previously spoken, and I've been here before on projects for the university and for other construction projects, as you know, in previous projects on the dormitories and the science center that were built two years ago, I did a little research on it. And I'm with the bricklayers and allied craft workers. And for this, the, uh, project for the dormitories alone, we had, the bricklayers alone had 30,000 man hours. The laborers, which are co-workers of ours that we depend upon to get the materials to us, had about 20,000 man hours. That translated to over a million two hundred thousand dollar payroll. From that payroll, we figured that it was around twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars in city wage tax that was paid. Not Note that not all of those were city residents that worked on that project, but I can tell you as business manager for the bricklayers, when a project comes into the city in whatever area it is, we use the local residents first in that area and give them the opportunity to work close to home. As we exhaust our work lists, we move into Dunmore and Riverside and Mid Valley, places like that. Occasionally we get the opportunity to outreach in, a, in, in a, other areas, maybe Schuylkill County or Monroe County. When the, the project, the, the dormitories and the science project were being concurrently bid, I had 100% employment. And that was city workers, people that worked in the boroughs surrounding us. That was a great thing. Currently, I have about 70% unemployment at the present time. As you can see, there's not much going on around in the city of Scranton. And the work that is being done, those entities that came to you and asked for special considerations on tax breaks and LERDAs and stuff like that, they made a lot of promises not only to us but the council. If you were to go down on Greenridge Street where they're building that new project there for the elderly, all out of state workers. You know, there are a few workers from in the area there, but most of them are from out of town. The contractors are from out of town. Who checks to see that they pay city wage tax? Who checks to see that they pay the mercantile tax? I think these people are coming down here on a free ride. I don't think there's anybody that goes down and checks their books. We check, our, we check the books as the union. Our contractors are forced to pay the wages and the benefits and the taxes in, in the municipalities that they work in because we enforce that. So, you know, that's one of the things that uh, you can see by looking around the area. That's why we're here. We're here to support the university. 90% of the projects that I've been involved with in my type of work, I don't get everything at the university, but 90% of it comes to people at the city of Scranton. And I've asked that question. I've asked, where do you source materials and how do you do things like this? This is going to be a silver lead project. It's not going to be built to the, as a silver lead. It's going to be built to the standards of a silver, silver lead project. That means that most of the materials and everything is going to be sourced within a 200 mile radius of Scranton. That's going to benefit the businesses that live and work in the city of Scranton. That's going to benefit the people that live here in the city of Scranton. 
Third of things that when we come to you and we're looking to make sure that things are passed for the progression of this city, they're the things that you really don't know about, but we do, and they're the things we want to bring to your attention. And so when you're considering this tonight, I'd like you to consider all those facts, the, the contractors, the business people, the residents, the people that are all there, everybody that's going to benefit from a project like this. Uh, we've also met on other projects with Geisinger Medical Center and stuff today. They're going to do another wonderful project. That's going to be, that's going to double the incentive in the city. You're going to get double the permit fees, double the mercantile taxes. Everyone needs certain variances and certain things to happen to make these projects go. It's about time we take care of our own because those entities that come before us, like the ones that I spoke earlier on in the housing project over on Davis Street, no benefit to anybody. They benefit themselves. And one thing that really nobody knows about, when those people from out of state come here to work, and they work here eight, nine, 10 months, and they go back to South Carolina and Nevada where the unemployment compensation is 200 a, a week, they take our money. They take the money from Pennsylvania. They collect on Pennsylvania. They don't collect from North Carolina and Florida and places like that. They take our money back with them. They take our taxes back, and they take our money back with them. So that's what we asked for here tonight. We asked for that consideration. I'm sorry I went over, and thank you again. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Drew Simpson. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, Good, evening. Uh, Good evening. Again, I would also like to thank Council for all your past support uh, with, to the working people here in this area. Uh, you've been a great friend of ours, and uh, we always look forward to working with you and look forward to working with you in the future. Uh, I am a resident of the city of Scranton and I also am a representative of the United Brotherhood of Carpenters and Joiners of America. I also am here tonight to speak in support of the University of Scranton's Rehabilitation Center project. The University of Scranton has, since 2008, constructed four major projects with a cost of approximately $200 million. These projects alone have generated for the city of Scranton approximately $2.5 million in building permits and business privilege taxes. These figures do not include the smaller projects done yearly by the university. The university ut utilizes contractors who use a local workforce of professional tradespeople who earn an established area standard that includes family sustaining wages, health insurance, and retirement programs. The university is, only, is one of only a few entities who have continued to build and put our members to work through one of the worst economic times this country, state, and region has ever seen. One figure that is difficult for me to calculate is the amount of wage taxes paid to the city by our members who live in the city and work on these projects. Uh, one thing is assured that with the hundreds of carpenters who have worked on these projects, the city has benefited greatly. The University of Scranton's rehabilitation project comes at a time when two or three major projects in the city have been put on hold, causing our members to be unemployed. And with the new state laws on unemployment makes many of them unable to collect. This project, takes, this project takes a property that is not on the tax rolls and hasn't been since its days as the YWCA and will make it another gateway to the city as you enter from the expressway onto Jefferson Avenue. And by incorporating the existing Linden Street entrance into the new building, keeps intact some of the architectural heritage of the building. This project will bring to the city coffers approximately $445,000 in building permits, $280,000 in mercantile tax, $17,000 in plan review and an unknown amount of wage taxes, and another $47 million to the total the university has spent in building and an investment in the city. There have been numerous projects in the past and one currently that have, been, have received KOZ or alerted tax breaks to build in the city that were approved by council. Most of these projects bring in out of, an out-of-town contractor and an out-of-town workforce, and most recently an undocumented workforce from California and Las Vegas. These workers do not pay local taxes and they take their money back to whatever state they came from. The University of Scranton has never turned its back on the local workforce as council hasn't. So tonight I ask the council accept the recommendation of the Architectural Review Board and approve the certificate of appropriateness so we can put our members back to work. Thank you for our, your consideration. Thank, Thank you. you. Joanne Davis. have a couple of packets here. I can bring them to you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank 
you. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Joanne Davis. I am a resident of Scranton and owner of Mrs. D's, a pizza hoagie and beer eatery on South Washington Avenue across from McDonald's in the Southside Shopping Center. The purpose of my appearance tonight is not only to inform Scranton residents and council of a feral cat problem in the city, but to offer a possible solution in managing the problem. Like many communities, we have a serious feral cat problem. Unfortunately, it is our responsibility as a community to attempt to fix it or more realistically manage it. The recent stabbing of a cat by a university student was outrageous. Cats are being poisoned and run down on the streets daily. Euthanizing them is not the solution, as the Humane Society of the United States website states, quote, even if there were enough money to remove and euthanize feral cats, others would move into the vacant territory to take advantage of the food source and shelter now made available. It is an endless cycle. I am aware of the recent ordinances adopted by some of our neighboring communities, which issues fines to good-hearted citizens for feeding these desolate animals. I am hopeful that this council would never consider such an uncivilized ordinance. The Humane Society of the United States addresses this, is this issue by stating, quote, the logic is that people think if there is no food available, the cats will go away. However, they are territorial animals who can survive for weeks without food and will not easily leave to search for new food, food sources. Instead, they tend to move closer into human habitations as they grow more desperate. Their malnourished condition will make them more susceptible to parasitic infestations such as fleas. They will continue to reproduce, resulting in the visible deaths of many kittens and cats thus making the situation much worse instead of improving it. Another reason is that the bans are nearly impossible to enforce. Experience shows that people who care about cats will go to great lengths to help a starving animal." Unquote. The Humane Society of the United States also st states that a program called TNR, which stands for Trap, Neuter, Release, has proven to work. Feral cats are trapped, neutered, and returned to their territory. They no longer reproduce, and because of this, it dramatically reduces fighting and the noise associated with mating. Foul odors are greatly reduced as well because neutered male cats no longer spray. Neutered cats also travel less, so they are less of a nuisance. TNR improves the quality of life for existing colonies, preventing the birth of more cats and significantly reduces the number of cats over time. Additionally, many groups that provide resources for TNR have calculated that the costs associated with TNR are considerably less than those related to the removal and euthanasia of feral cats." Unquote. I myself can testify to that because for the past 10 years I have been feeding feral cats by my home near Nayog Park. I have personally found that using the TNR method has been much more cost efficient and limits new arrivals into the colony. The Journal of Feline Medicine and Surgery found that over an 11 year period in six different states, less than 1% of 103,643 feral cats examined had to be euthanized due to infection disease or debilitating conditions, less than 1%. With this information, the solution is to fully implement TNR. We at Mrs. D's initi initiated a fund called Street Cats. Thanks to the good people of Eastern Pennsylvania Animal Alliance, or EPAA for short, we have been able to use these monies to neuter feral cats. EPAA charges just $35 for each medical procedure, whether male or female, and includes ear tipping, which I'll explain in a minute, as well as an injection for rabies. This is $15 cheaper than what Griffin Pond Animal Shelter costs the city to euthanize a cat. The procedure, which is performed by a veterinarian, gives the cat cats a chance to live their lives by then releasing them back to their territories. Thus far, we have come across many caregivers who feed and care for feral cats. Cats do have a home. It's the outdoors where they have been living for more than 10,000 years, and it's their natural habitat. The clinic, however, is not only for feral cats, but for family pets. The charge for a family cat is $60. This involves neutering and injections for rabies and distemper. The cost for these services as a, at a veterinarian is approximately $225. Some families who have limited financial resources and cannot afford the cost of veterinarian now have a much more affordable option. Unfortunately, some of these family cats are part of the problem when they are not neutered and allowed to stray. 
For a family cat, there is also the option of ear tipping, which is a surgical procedure in which approximately one quarter inch is removed from the, the tip of the cat's left ear. This identifies it as having already been neutered in case it is trapped again. Having been identified as a neutered cat, it would then be immediately released and all feral cats are automatically ear tipped. A worthwhile footnote while I have learned of more recently is a neighbor of a friend called the city to help with feral cats in their neighborhood and they were told by the city they no longer trap cats and it is up to the individual to trap, take the cat wherever they seem fit and pay for the results of their actions out of their own pocket, which makes this drive even more important. And I thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, could you state your name, please? My name is Christine Sislo. I'm a resident oh, of Scranton. Oh, I see. You're next on the list. Yes. yes. I'm a resident of Scranton. And I am a volunteer for Mrs. D's Street Cats. I would like to emphasize that this service is possible due to the devoted group from Broadheadsville called Eastern Pennsylvania Animal Alliance. The entire process is fa fairly simple. The group, which includes a veterinarian, travels in an RV to Mrs. D's and they arrive early in the morning. We have a van already set up in one of Mrs. D's parking lots to temporarily house the animals. The volunteers of Mrs. D's register the cats and accept payments, which are made at the time of registration. Again, it is $35 for a feral cat and $60 for a family pet. The owner leaves the cat and a telephone number. Mrs. D's volunteers also observe the cat before and after surgery and contact the owners when the cats are ready to be picked up later that same day. One obvious question is how do we trap a feral cat and bring it to Mrs. D's? For those who do not have traps, we do, and we will lend them to you and show you how to use them. It's pretty easy. We have met many others bringing cats in their own traps in an attempt to manage the problem in their neighborhood. To these people, we say keep up the good work, and when you get your area under control, please help us help others who don't have traps and transportation. We are all in this together, and together as a community, we can make a difference. For appointments, please visit EPAA's website at epaaonline.com or call them at 570-994-5846. If you have any questions about feral cats, trapping, or would like a volunteer, like to volunteer at Mrs. D's in connection with this worthwhile community service, please call 570-604-4008. Donations, which are solely used for neutering feral cats and injections, are also accepted at Mr. D's, Mrs. D's. Checks should be made out to Saint or Street Cats and sent in care of Mrs. D's at 519 South Washington Avenue in Scranton, Pennsylvania, 18505. Thus far, we have neutered a total of 85 cats at our three clinics. 17 of those have been paid for by funds from Street Cats. It is noteworthy that the great majority of these costs associated with neutering feral cats is paid for by caring individuals bringing in the cats. The monies are limited in St. Cats Fund, is available to those who cannot afford the service. So if there are feral cats in your area, and believe me, they're all over the city, and you would like to help manage the problem, please contest, contact us at 570-604-4008. I would like to conclude by saying if you think by fixing just one cat isn't helping, listen to what the Alley Cat Alleys proclaims. One female cat and her offspring in a seven year period, hypothetically, can produce 420,000 kittens. I ask the council to review the current contract with Griffin Pond Animal Shelter as it relates to euthanizing cats for $50 per animal and give careful thought to providing funds to St. Cats to humanely neuter these animals. It appears that neutering is not only healthier for the colony and cheaper, but in the long term, it is much more cost effective in managing the problem. We would also like to ask a council member how we could stay in touch with one of you and be able to announce our upcoming clinics. Those dates are always available at EPAA's website and the next two clinic dates in June are the 4th and the 18th their voicemail is very limited, so please be brief and they will call you back. They are volunteers and the EPAA is a nonprofit organization. And above all, please spread the word and don't forget to call us with any questions. Again, at 570-604-4008. Thank you.
Thank, Thank you, you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Doug Miller. Good evening, Council. Doug Miller, Scranton. Um, Good just Good uh, like to start off tonight by uh, piggybacking on a, a couple of comments that were made last week uh, by, I believe it was Mr. Morgan. And I thought he made a lot of sense with the argument he, he brought up, and that was uh, in regards to uh, the city's 2014 operating budget. And as uh, dealing with uh, council uh, making a budget that I also agree with him should be a, uh, an interim budget that only provides the services that we need to get us started. And I think we should let the, new, the, the uh, incoming council that will take office in 2014 open the budget up and do what they told us they were going to do throughout the entire campaign. They all thought it was so easy uh, for four months and uh, they had answers to everything. And uh, they think uh, that it's so easy to not have to raise taxes and that uh, you know, making cuts solves all of our problems and, and cooperation solves all of our problems. So why not let them come in and uh, let's see what they have. The new mayor, the new council. Let them put their money where their mouth is. They made a lot of promises throughout the campaign. Let's see if they have the ability to do the job because, quite frankly, I don't feel they do. And we like to, you know, sit back and laugh and make a mockery out of this council. When I think next year at this time, as I said two weeks ago, yeah, we'll be laughing. And are we going to ask ourselves, you know, uh, do we miss the good old days? The good old days? Yeah, you bet we will. Because I think we're taking for granted what we have here. And you could be bullied and you could be name-called and you could be... Uh, you know, told that you didn't do the job the right way. Well, people don't realize, you know, the difficult task you had of making that budget. And that before you even went into that budget, you had to craft a recovery plan. And I don't think you were given enough credit for that. And I think, you know, we hear speaker after speaker who come up here week after week and, and tell us how we should run the city and they all cite off their, their resumes. And, you know, I'm going to rebut Mr. Jackwitz because uh, I understand he did bring my name up last week. Uh, referring to me many times as Young Miller. Um, I don't have a problem with the Young Miller claim. I know that that's a, uh, uh, you know, a sign of disrespect, but I don't mind that. I, I know I'm, I'm youthful. I think that's uh, actually an asset to me uh, because many individuals my age are fleeing the city uh, and I chose to stay here. So I'm going to respond to old Jack Woods. Uh, he made a statement that I'm a, a cheerleader for failed government. I take that as a compliment, being a cheerleader. You're right, I am a cheerleader, Mr. Jack Woods. I appreciate that. I've been a cheerleader here for 12 years, cheerleading a good cause, trying to cheerlead good government and to see that my city moves forward in a positive direction so that my generation has a reason to stay here. I think we're all cheerleaders to a certain degree. Mr. Jackowitz is a cheerleader. I think we could all recall for years Mr. Jackowitz came here weekly wearing a Legion of Doom t-shirt cheerleading his cause. So we all are here for one reason and that's to see the city move forward and to see good productive things happen. And I think, quite frankly, it's unfair when we have individuals like Mr. Jackwitz who come up here. And I appreciate his service to the country and all, everything he cited. But he's missing one thing. It has nothing to do with council. What does it have to do with council? I appreciate his service to the country. I appreciate that he's had lunch with presidents. I'm sure, I'm, I'm sure the presidents probably didn't make any decisions regarding the country until they sat down with him. And, you know, while we're on that subject of, you know, having the next council come in and do the budget, perhaps... You know, Mr. Jackwitz himself, the, the, you know, the guru of knowledge, let him come in and offer his service. You know, he has all the answers. Let Mr. Jackwitz come in, since he thinks he could do your job, which I personally don't think he'd last five minutes in your spot. Let him come in and help do a budget. You know, he's gone on to say that the council's not qualified. He wants to talk about facts. So let's do that tonight. Let's talk fact. I have a copy with me tonight, Article 2 of the uh, city's Home Rule Charter. Uh, section 201 through 204, uh, 204. has to do with uh, the governing body and division of powers. Basically, to summarize it, it talks about the two powers of government, the legislative branch and the executive branch. So to simplify it for Mr. Jackowitz and anybody else out there that may not understand it, because those of us who have paid attention and understand how the city functions wouldn't have to refer to this, but I figured tonight we'd have to educate people like Mr. Jackowitz. You're the legislative branch. You pass legislation. It's the guy downstairs. It's his job to enforce it. So when we come up here and we criticize you for things not being implemented and we wonder why revenue enhancements haven't been implemented, we could go knock on the door downstairs and ask and, and, and get our answers down there. You can only implement. You can only try. There's other people involved. They have a job to do as well. You can't run the entire city. Uh, we talked about bankruptcy, and he made a comment that my statements were misleading. 
they weren't misleading at all. If we did a little research like I did, uh, I pulled up an article today from uh, Stockton, California. As we all know, they're the uh, United States' uh, largest city to file for bankruptcy. And I pulled up an article from April 1st of this year in regards to uh, their public safety. And I just would like to cite a few of the, uh, the paragraphs in here. Stockton's violent crime rate jumped 25% from 2011 to 2012. In an attempt to stay solvent, the city of 296,000 people cut 25% of its police force, resulting in a record number of homicides and a surge in property crimes. What did this do? Well, it prompted the Council of Stockton to consider raising their sales tax to 8.75% to make up for the lost revenue so that they can hire back an additional 25 police officers. This is fact, Mr. Jackowitz. This is just an example of what would go on in the city of Scranton. So when we come up here and we say we want to file for bankruptcy, maybe we should file tomorrow. And maybe that's the only way people are going to realize how great they have it today, that tomorrow when they wake up and they see less police officers on the street, less firemen, and a garbage collection that goes from weekly to monthly. So I think we really need to sit back. I think a lot of us need a wake-up call of reality and fact, because the facts are right here. I've listened to a lot of silliness week after week, and it's time to get into reality. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes our sign-in sheet. Is there anyone else who would like to address council? Good evening, council. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Mary Chalipko, resident city of Scranton, getting to be a repeat offender here at council. Um, I just want to comment briefly on the program that those women so um, gallantly are running. There are lovely cats in my neighborhood. I've had three spayed already, and there is such a need. I know our animal control officer has been out for surgery for a while now. So it is a problem in the city, and there's no backup for animal control. So if, if he's out, you know, he's out for surgery, I do know him personally, he does a great job, it's impossible. And as she said, with a kill shelter, and according to her figures, it is cheaper to spay or neuter than to euthanize, which I am very strongly against. Um, one positive for Pinebrook, I was told today that we will be receiving mulch for the playground at the Pinebrook Field which is very badly needed. We have some very poor kids or disadvantaged kids in our neighborhood who that will certainly benefit. So we're very grateful to the Department of, I believe it's part Public Works for that. Next, uh, I saw two articles in the paper today about the swimming pools. And the only one not mentioned again is Kapouse Avenue or Penn Ridge um, with its extensive repairs, as we were told. Um, I did see where Wells Fargo will donate to open Weston Park and Weston Field. So one question is, will that free up some of the money designated for those parks to at least do some of the repairs at Penridge? Can somebody? I, I don't believe there was any money uh, allocated in this year's budget for any type of pool repairs. So, Didn't so what, would have, what is being uh, donated by Wells Fargo is what's enabling those two pools to open. And then the um, um, OECD Urban Development Action Grant funds are being used to open two additional pools and make the improvements to them that are necessary to get them open. Oh, because I thought the other pools were mentioned with that OECD money, Weston Park, and I'll have to no, go back the, the, and look again. The OECD money is, um, I would say, much like a matching fund or a matching grant to what's being provided by Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo will sponsor two pools, basically, and then Councilman Joyce suggested using the RERI money that is the UDAG RERI account okay. money to oh. open the two additional pools and make the improvements. Okay, that wasn't the way I understood it. Um, I know the people in Pinebrook and Green Ridge are very anxious. Well, first of all, they don't want to see it. It's, it's blight. It's an eyesore, and they don't want to see it just raised. 
Mm -hmm. um, so I guess I'm asking, there are some volunteers, there are some people that have approached me that would like to do some physical work, um, take a look at the pool, and possibly have a fundraiser because Nova and Breen, and not, I don't want to mention any other names of pools that may need work, but um, it's important. It's an important part of our neighborhood. As I said, we're probably one of the lowest in the low to mod neighborhoods in the city. And somehow, I know Mr. Rogan, you've been involved, not to put you on the spot, with Pinebrook in the past, and Mr. Loscom. Um, I would just like if there's any way that we can look into it and see if we can come up with any way to save that pool. Even if we made some of the repairs that have made it, you know, we we'd said it's, the mayor said they're extensive, so even if we could take a look at it and just try to do something to maybe upgrade it just a little bit. And that's all I have to say. Thank you for the mulch. And I would volunteer to help save the cats, and I would hope that others in the city, I spoke briefly to the ladies out in the hall, and I would hope that other people would step up. There are a lot of people stepping up in the city. I've noticed that in the last few minutes, or a few months, I'm sorry, with the animals and projects and food trucks and everything else that, that really benefits the city of Scranton. So for that, I'm very happy. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Good evening, Council. Marie Schumacher, resident and taxpayer. Good evening. Uh, will there be a second reading of 5B? Yes, no? A second reading? Yeah. Um, well, it's only, it's on the um, agenda tonight for introduction, solely for so introduction. So there will be. Okay, I just one question that I would <coughs> like answered during motions is, is, is this structure within the institutional zone of the University of Scranton? I don't believe that it is. I think that's beyond the cutoff. So um, uh, during motions, I, I would like to have that either denied or reinforced. Um, next. I'll answer that question. It is beyond the institutional district of the University of Scranton. OK. I think it's time we start using our zoning um, laws as they are, statutes as they are. I don't know the answer right now as to whether this building would be permitted in the zone would it, which, in which it is being constructed. That I don't know. I mean, I haven't reviewed the zoning ordinance. Yeah. But well, uh, it is beyond the institutional district. So, if that ends if, at Jefferson if, Avenue. Yeah. If okay. If we're ever going to uh, to have, I mean, there's no reason for having an institutional zone if we're not going to enforce the the boundaries, so I think that that's something that needs to be looked at, certainly. Um, next, I'm extremely disappointed that none of the EU Council members uh, even thought enough last week when you were voting to transfer the money from the, uh, the sale of the Duffy Park properties to inform us about what is happening to the statue. Uh, I'm, I'm especially uh, disappointed in Mr. Rogan, who is, of course, too young to uh, remember either of the World Wars or maybe even know any, uh, know any relatives that fought in those wars and sacrificed. Um, and I just think it's a shame, and, and God help this, his generation, if they forget what's been done for them and all the blood that's been well, shed. I, I certainly didn't forget. We, we have, and my grandfather fought in and actually, both of my grandfathers fought in the well, World if, Wars. If you hold your comments um, until No, I want to finish this point because you struck a nerve. Um, this was regarding the funding. This wasn't regarding the monuments. I think every single person on but, this board and the mayor will do what's right to make sure that that statue is, is put the, back up. The question that was raised two weeks ago was, was there money in? You, you all didn't appropriate it. So where is the money coming from to to make, to move that and store it and restore it or whatever happens to do with it. You didn't answer that question. I don't think you researched it to find out what's going to happen. It's just, oh yeah, you know. And I remember a wonderful monument that was at Pastoria School. It was shaped like a, it was shaped like a cross and it was uh, war heroes and it was, it was a beautiful thing and nobody knows what happened to that. It just, the school was sold and the monument disappeared and, you know, just tough, 
those people whose names were on there, I guess, don't matter to the current generation. I think that's sad. Uh, so I just think transferring that money to paving before it was known whether or not there is money to do what's appropriate for that statue. Um, and I will give uh, Jamie tonight a, a little bit on the Scranton Doughboy. And there's lots of, you can go to the website if you're interested and get a lot more information. Th that one happens to be one of only 23 that Zinc cast. Um, and it matters to a lot of people. And again, I'm, I'm sorry that, that it wasn't even addressed before the vote last night. It would have been, last week, it would have been very nice to have been brought up to date on how that is going to be provided. So just charge on. Uh, now moving to the controller's report for the month of April. It shows a year-to-date real estate tax revenue as a percent of the total revenue lagging the prior year by 5%. This is troubling. Um, I would like to request uh, the finance chair obtain the number of properties for which uh, taxes had been received by the end of April in each of these years, as it may be that the saturation point for obtaining additional revenue from property taxes increase has been reached. Um, that's troubling. Fortunately, the, the wage taxes are up, so that's a, that's a help. But I'm really concerned about the property taxes. Uh, further, the impact on, on the lag, uh, of, on the operating budget of this lag, is even greater if the amount shown in the controller's report is the 122% of last year's revenue. And the 22% has not been taken out, which is dedicated to the unfunded debt. So I think it's an important issue. Um, and I, I would hope that Mr. Joyce is able to get, a, get the number of properties that have paid taxes this year as opposed to last year and see if there's a trend there. And then Mr. McGough, last week you, you spoke of a, a Pell, that Pell is coming up with a, a, stat, a budget status. And could you please tell us when that budget status update will be available? Yesterday. Yesterday? Did you say? Yesterday. Okay, so are, does the clerk's office have copies, or do you have copies? I have a copy, yes. I, I believe you, all council members do, and I believe the clerk's office does. Are you going to be speaking to it tonight? Uh, personally, or, no. I. Okay, Mr. Joyce, will you be speaking to that tonight? We. I just received yeah. it, so I'm going to take some time to review it over the next week, and I'll discuss it next week. Okay. Council members just received it this okay. evening in their mail. So okay. we've not had the opportunity to review it. Okay. How many pages is it? It's it's a little lengthy, so okay. it's it's Three not pages. just a page or two pages. It's okay. Thank it, you. It covers You'll have a comprehensive next amount week, of info. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> um. Good evening, Council. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I'd like to agree with Marie tonight on the monument. Um, you know, we're losing all these monuments across this nation. Gettysburg has been chopped up and lots of, lots of it's been sold off. In Hawaii, they're getting rid of a, uh, a pool that was built in remembrance of the World War I veterans because they don't want to refund its uh, reconstruction. I think we have a very shallow uh, memory of our own history and I think we should be protecting these things and, and I don't think that's really t taking place in our country and I just hope that the city doesn't blow this one. Um, I remember being a kid walking by that statue a couple of times. I don't know if it's true or not that it was knocked over a couple of times and repaired a couple of times but I think we should have a lot more respect for the people who've sacrificed their lives for our nation and sacrificed their families and their wealth and everything else in regards to our nation. I mean, we can't even find a, a plaque that was put up to a former mayor, I believe, at the Southside Sports Complex. So, I mean, if we have such disrespect for the sacrifices of former Scrantonians not to guard these sites and not to make sure the right things are done, then I think we're responsible for that ourselves. And I don't, Mr. Mr. Rogan, I don't think anybody should be offended by somebody wanting to protect a site. My, my grandfather was a World War I veteran, great-great-grandfather who was mustard gassed. 
And uh, I believe my father told me he used to breathe ammonia to clear his lungs. And I just think that, you know, it's easy to look at the sacrifices of others and not give it the standing it should have. And I'm not saying you're doing that, Mr. Rogan. I just think that we need to really reconsider how we're going to protect these. I mean, we've got some artifacts, I think, don't we, in the basement from the old Civil War Museum, unless they've moved them somewhere. Mm -hmm. So evidently, these things are very mm -hmm. important to this city, or they should be. We've got great monuments at Nayog Park. We got, I believe we have the hatch cover from the main. I mean, they're just very, very important things that should be always protected. That's my opinion. And the last comment I have here is that I think that that feral cat program is a wonderful idea. And I think that if it's possible, this council should look for some amount of funding to move this project, even though they probably haven't asked the council for funding. But I think that sometimes projects are worthy and people shouldn't come here and ask for money. I think that we should realize that they're important and the great benefit they can do for this city because I see feral cats everywhere and they're, they're absolutely everywhere. And I don't know why the laws don't make people accountable for their animals, but, and I'm not asking this council to cut Griffin Pond's funding because evidently they do a wonderful job. But I just think that uh, that lady just stated some wonderful statistics and um, I've, I've walked the neighborhoods like most of you have and you bump into people that are feeding 5, 10, 15 cats and they just, their heart is just attached to these animals. And I just hope the council would consider that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Dave Dobson, resident of Scranton. Good evening. Good evening. <coughs> Taxes paid and so forth. Uh, on these polls, uh, I read an article where we're short on lifeguards, and it's probably a little late this year, but if Weston Pool were open during the winter and we could get high school students, like from a swim team or something like that, and train them, and then they would be somewhat indentured, I mean, uh, uh, that they'd have to work for the city of Scranton, just like the volunteer fire departments do if you volunteer for EMT training, you have to pay them back unless you fulfill your obligation, your pledge to work as an EMT. It would, we could probably uh, and create a good job for a, a kid from Scranton that's going away to college in the fall. So uh, it's something to consider, at least for next year. It's a little late this year, probably. And uh, I've spoken about trash removal several times, and there seems to be some confusion here. The DPW, people keep coming to me and telling me the DPW tells them that the reason they have to put their recycling out front is, is because uh, the trucks won't fit up the courts. And it's kind of offensive because they see uh, the trash truck going up the court, and it's the same type of truck. So now I would recommend that the DPW give the real reason is that we don't have to stand there and debate for 15 minutes whether something is trash or it, uh, recycling. It needs to be sequestered. We can't pick up. Uh, couple bottles on the top and find out that there's a half a ton of doggy doodle in the bottom. I mean, you don't want to have that mixed in with, so uh, it, it's plain and simple and it, their, uh, their uh, explanation is uh, at the DPW is totally, uh, totally insufficient. And uh, now we had a mention here about building uh, with the uh, tax exempts and institutional zones and uh, the only thing I have to say on it is once we start going out the institutional zone I want to see everybody in a job I want to see the university healthy and their footprint because it's high value buildings is not as big as what would uh, warrant if it were just housing or something like that but it's time for people will start considering paying taxes when we go outside the institutional zone of some type because 33% of our city is currently tax exempt and 
it's the little old mamas and papas that are picking up the tab. I talk to people that are, that their, their mothers are living on 600 bucks a month. So we can't continue to afford to raise their taxes and, and put them out of, a, it's gonna put them out of a home if they're not well on their way already with 600 bucks a month. Uh, you're taking, they're taking money out of their own family pocket to support their mother and supplement and keep them in the house. And uh, a lot of things have been said about council and the vote and public attitude, last week especially. And I don't find the attendance at the last election worth offending anybody. 25%. Shame, shame, shame. We have lots of complaints, I hear it, and I'm starting to mention to people about the turnout, and I can see by the grimace on their face that maybe they weren't one of the people that turned out. And it's a shame. You need to get the facts straight, and we're only started on this Scranton recovery and it's not going to happen overnight, and it's not going to happen in four years. And we need some changes. Uh, we need a two-term mayor. We get too entrenched, too entrenched with three and four terms. It's just too long, and they run out of ideas, and uh, they get too many friends along the way. And when you have a friend that's a friend of a friend, it gets too uh, inconvenient to tell them to wise up. You're not doing things the way they should. So we need a two-term executive. And uh, furthermore, I'd like to uh, remind America, start voting against the trade packs, please. People are going backwards and backwards and backwards on wages. And it's, it's just... How, how does somebody continue to keep their head above water when they lose half their wages? 60% of the people that lost their wages in 2007 are working for 30% less. And they're also drawn, there's about 30% of the people are drawn on their retirement out of 401ks and paying more taxes than Mr. Romney on it. So. Thank, Thank you, you, and have a good night, and don't forget to bok, bok, bok. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone Thank else you. who cares to address council? Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Jim Devers. I am the Assistant Vice President for Facilities Operations at the University of Scranton, and I'd like to respond to the question regarding the zoning. Uh, it is true that this building is out of the institutional zone. It is in the central business district. However, we have done extensive uh, studies. Our architects and engineers have uh, studied the zoning code and the building is a permitted use in the central business district. Also, the building, uh, Leahy Hall, is used by the occupational physical therapy departments that serves the city of Scranton and the residents of the city of Scranton. What we want to do is build a new and improved facility that will offer the same services. We have the Leahy Clinic that's located in the building next door, uh, McGurran Hall. Our intention is to connect the two buildings and uh, make that a very vibrant corner uh, and a very uh, signature type building for not only the university but the city of Scranton. And if you have any questions regarding the zoning or the building itself, I'd be happy to answer them at this time. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who cares to address council? This is great. Five A motions. Councilman McGough, do you have any comments or motions tonight? Uh, just very briefly. Um, first of all, uh, since it was brought up, the uh, we did receive an update from Pell. Um, I will. Um, defer to uh, Mr. Joyce uh, for you know, a response uh, you know, next week. But I will say, a couple things I will say, um, that the mem memorandum that was sent from Pell um, is very optimistic. And I think that optimism speaks to the cooperative, cooperative effort that the council and the administration has made to try and implement the 2013 budget 
and to implement the recovery plan initiatives. Um, I hope that this optimism can carry over through the rest of 2013 and um, continue into 2014. But um, Pell seems to indicate that they feel that we're moving in the right direction and I believe also that we're moving in the right direction. And second thing, and, and last thing, that I, um, I too, I guess, maybe took a little bit of offense at the presumption that because we didn't provide some kind of funding for the Duffy Memorial that we don't care about it. Um, I've lived in Southside my entire life. Um, th that memorial has been part of my life. Um, it was actually a football field for a while when we were very young. Um, it was, the statue set a nice pick for running, uh, you know, pass patterns, but uh, mm -hmm. um, that nonetheless. Um, I, I think that pr presumption is erroneous. I think we all feel, you know, that that is something that needs to be preserved. Um, and we spoke last week that all of us, I think, indicated that we would find a way in which that memorial will be preserved and will be kept. Um, but just because we didn't do a funding for it um, is not an indication that we don't care. Um, we will, I'm sure, continue to work to preserve that memorial and to make sure that it is, um, you know, placed in a proper area where it will be, you know, part of the history and um, part of, you know, the city of Scranton. And that's all I have. Thank you. I'm done. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm so sorry. And Councilman Rogan, do you have comments or motions tonight? Yes, thank you. Very briefly, um, just to comment on the, the comments that were made about Duffy Park. The, the vote last week was not a vote to remove the monument or, or, or move the monument anywhere. And there were comments, I, I believe it might have been Mr. Loscom or, or a speaker that said, well, what about placing it in Aog Park, mm -hmm. um, which is a great idea. It's the most utilized park in the city. And I do take offense to the comments that I, I don't understand, you know, the sacrifices. And I study history. I have family members that fought in, those, in, in the World Wars. And I've always fought for veterans. Um, you know, just last year, last year's budget, I introduced an amendment to give a tax break to veterans. I purchased a flag just last month, um, a three by five flag for the Vietnam Memorial up at Naog. And uh, that's why I took offense to those comments. Um, it, it was simply allocating the funding that we're getting for that land. It wasn't a sale of the monument or anything of that nature. And I'm sure everyone on council would agree, and the mayor, and I don't agree with the mayor on much, but I'm sure everyone agrees that the monument needs to be placed appropriately mm -hmm. um, somewhere in the city, and that's what I'll fight, and I think we'll all fight to see that that happens. Um, two other issues, I, I will be voting yes for the agenda item regarding the uh, architectural review for um, the University of Scranton. And a couple of reasons why I support it. One, as was, was mentioned, it will create a, a number of jobs in the city which are, are desperately needed right now. And also, I've, I've always said with the University of Scranton, we, we would like them to grow and get bigger. I've, I've went there, but we would like them to grow up instead of out. Um, this takes one of their buildings that they already own. They're not acquiring new property. Um, so this, this is something that I will support. Um, finally, just one request. Um, can we please send a letter to the DPW and the contractor that paved uh, Snyder Avenue asking that curbs are put in. Um, residents on the 1200 block, and I have a couple specific addresses, they report that when it rains, the water comes down the hill and it's now flooding their properties. Um, I have that here, and I also have some pictures that, if, that I could send in tomorrow as well of some of the yards that were um, flooded from the rain the last couple of days. So that is all I have for tonight. Thank you. Thank you. And Councilman Loscombe, do you have motions or comments? Just briefly, I, I echo my uh, fellow colleagues on the uh, statue situation. Uh, I know we're all interested in that. To, to, to accuse us of, of ignoring it is, is false. I went to the, uh, I believe it was over two years ago, the meeting on the uh, Harrison Avenue Bridge. 
And I have to go back through my notes and I will contact uh, PennDOT, but I thought at that time they were looking at three different locations of the road. They were gonna relocate that park over off the road there, which would contain, that, that would be part of, of, that would be the new Duffy Park with the statue. That was my understanding, but I will follow up to, to make sure of that. Um, so that, that's why we didn't show a concern because, you know, it would be, it, it'll be taken care of one way or another. But, you know, I was offended also. Um, Mr. Rogan mentioned about the paving and that, and we, we all, I mean, I think he mentioned Jackson Street. It's just paved and they're ready to cut into it already, right up the whole length. Um, you know, I, I don't know, I mentioned it probably two years ago when we were putting out bids for paving. I don't know who's responsible, is it the engineer, is it the contractor, but everyone, all utilities should be notified prior to those contracts uh, starting that the roads are going to be paved. And they should have a certain time period that they come in. If I could see an emergency, but they're replacing lines. These were pre-planned for years now. Uh, so, I mean, it's a folly. We, we got enough bad roads in the city as it is, but they have to put up with this. But my other thing is sewer lids. Some of these newly paved streets are beautiful to drive on until you drop in those sewer lids. They haven't been brought up to level. And I don't know what the, you know, do we contact the sewer authority? Again, this should be the contractor's responsibility before they get paid to make sure those roads are inspected and properly completed. And uh, I guess that's it. I'll reserve other comment for uh, when, when the vote is. And thank you, Councilman Loscombe. Councilman Joyce, do you have any comments or motions? Yes, I'm going to try to be as brief as possible. <clears throat> uh, the other week, uh, to answer some citizens' questions that came up, Mrs. Schumacher asked uh, about the um, real estate taxes being designated and um, we did receive a response from our tax collector, Bill Courtright, and he states that in response to the letter that we sent him on May 10th, uh, yes, all amounts designated to the unfunded debt borrowing are paid and are reflected in the city's real estate distribution of funds. As of the date of this letter, which he sent on May 23rd, uh, required payments made to M&T Bank and First Liberty Bank and Trust are paid in full through the end of May 2013. So that's just one tidbit of information. Also, we received some information from the single tax office regarding uh, comparisons uh, in regard to where we are this year at the end of May in comparison to where we were last year at the end of May. So far for the real estate tax, uh, last year, as of May 31st, 2012, the city um, received 10, $10,210,229.90 from the tax office. This year so far we've received 12,730,160.84, which is a 24.68% increase. However, you have to factor in that there was a 22% increase in um, the real estate tax. So uh, we're collecting at a slightly higher rate. Uh, delinquent real estate taxes last year, as of 531 2012, we received 365,449.47. This year, uh, we received 344,738.17, which is down 5.67%, or $20,711.30. As far as the local service tax, uh, or as some refer to the emergency services tax, as of 531-2012, we received 429,628.16. This year, as of 531, um, we have received 
742,317.48, and that's an increase of 72.78%, or $312,689.32. And as far as the business privilege and mercantile taxes are concerned, um, last year, as of this point, we received 1,515,725.77. So far this year, we've received 1,869,283.42, and that's an increase of 23.33%, or $353,557.65. And also, we have to take into account that there was an increase of 12.5% uh, to the um, business privilege tax and, and mercantile taxes over the past year, but we are collecting a little bit more at, at, a, at a better rate than we were last year at the same time. Also, um, just to inform everyone, there were some bids uh, sent in uh, and opened on Wednesday, May 29th in council chambers for the city of Scranton seasonal chemicals for swimming pools, excluding the AUG pool for the calendar year of 2013. We have two bidders being Miracle Chemical Company and Main Pool and Chemical Incorporated. So once uh, uh, a bidder is chosen, I'll further inform of who it was. And also, council received an email. Well, before I get to that, I will announce that we received a uh, check from Comcast in regard to the franchise fee payment that we're owed in the amount of $207,059.52. And also Comcast, a, uh, they sent a notification that effective June 27th, the um, Inspiration Channel will be added to Channel 295 on the Digital Starter Channel lineup for those interested and um, issues with Comcast. <clears throat> Moving on, uh, we did receive an email uh, in Council's office regarding uh, the property on uh, River and Meadow Street, and that's the last home in the 1000 block of River. Um, we've received some complaints before uh, as of the past week, uh, some companies are putting up very large billboards on, the, on that property, advertising their business phone numbers, etc. cetera. Uh, and uh, the residents want us to report this to the appropriate departments and hopefully uh, get something done about this, as this is a residential zone and the residents want to keep it that way. And they're worried that this is turning into a local garbage dump for signs. So, Mrs. Craig, if we could please notify uh, Director Seitzinger of this, it would be greatly appreciated and ask him to research into this situation. And hopefully people aren't just throwing signs there. Also, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Rick Schrader for coming in, Jack Figured, um, Drew Simpson, and I, I don't want to miss anyone else. And also uh, Jim Bevers for coming in to explain uh, the project that is hopefully going to be in the works at, at the University of Scranton. I uh, am in support of this project. As Mr. Rogan said, it's uh, a good thing that they're building up and not out. It's going to create um, $400,000 in permit fees, as we learned, and also it'll um, have an economic impact to the city as far as um, mercantile taxes and business privilege taxes. So that would be, that's definitely a positive. And finally, last but not least, if we could send a letter to um, the appropriate party, I believe Mr. Dewar would be the most appropriate, and ask him about the status of the Rockwell Avenue Bridge. I think uh, hopefully we could get an answer on that and see 
when plans are being made for that bridge to be put back into service. And that's all for tonight. Thank you. Good evening. The terms of two zoning board members will expire effective July 1st, 2013. One of those individuals, Mr. Lance Stange, notified City Council previously that he is unable to continue his service following the completion of his current term. I thank Mr. Stange for his dedication and professionalism throughout his years as a zoning board member and Mrs. Wardell for her service in completing the term of the late James Williams. As a result of these two vacancies, I ask that all city residents who are interested in serving on the zoning board would submit a letter of interest and resume to the office of Scranton City Council on or before Friday, June 14th, 2013. Email submissions to council members will not be eligible for appointment. Again, the Office of Scranton City Council will accept only letters of interest and resumes mailed to or hand delivered to the Office of City Council on or before the deadline of Friday, June 14th, 2013, for the purpose of filling two positions on the Scranton Zoning Board. Next, included on tonight's agenda for introduction is a resolution accepting the recommendation of the Historical Architecture Review Board, or HARB, and approving the Certificate of Appropriateness for the University of Scranton for demolition of Leahy Hall, the former YWCA building located at the corner of Linden Street and Jefferson Avenue. Because of the ambiguous language contained in the resolution pertaining to the, quote, courtesy review, rather than a mitigation review of historic elements of the building, and the absence of a time frame for such review relative to demolition, I recommend that Council table this legislation tonight and request HARB well, table it tonight following introduction. I should have been more specific. And request HARB and the legal department to review and revise the legislation accordingly. Council needs to know what is meant by a courtesy review and what the plan is concerning the portico. Next, I received two ordinances pertaining to lease agreements between the City and United Neighborhood Centers for the Cabrini Center and the Bellevue Center. I asked Solicitor Hughes to review the legislation and he responded noting several concerns regarding the ordinances, including that despite the title presenting a 10-year lease, it is in fact a 40-year lease. Therefore, Mrs. Craig, please return the legislation to the legal department with Attorney Hughes's responses for correction before it can be placed on Council's agenda. In addition, Council received a response from Harold S. Hill, PE, Assistant District Executive of Construction with PennDOT, regarding the signalization at the intersection of North Washington Avenue and Linden Street in downtown Scranton. Mr. Hill states, our traffic unit reviews and monitors signal timings both during and after construction. Due to your concerns over the timing of this signal, our traffic unit inspected the intersection of North Washington Avenue and Linden Street. This is a preliminary inspection since the intersection is not complete yet. The city's contractor is making adjustments to the signal. And finally, in response to comments made during citizens' participation this evening by, I believe, uh, Mr. Figured and Mr. Simpson, uh, Mrs. Crake, I'd like a letter sent, please, to the single tax office requesting that they check into contractors performing work in the city of Scranton especially in conjunction with who has pulled permits from LIPS. 
I do believe, I listened carefully to what you were saying, and I, it is the responsibility of the single tax office to oversee and collect those taxes. And I thank you very much for bringing these situations to our attention. We will certainly make sure that the single tax office is made aware and that they do or perform their due diligence in obtaining the proper taxation from these uh, out of town, out of state employees. And that's it. 5B, accepting the recommendation of the Historical Architecture Review Board and approving the Certificate of Appropriateness for the University of Scranton, 800 Linden Street, Scranton, Pennsylvania, for demolition of Leahy Hall, to include courtesy review by the HARB for public incorporation of the Linden Street portico, public recognition of the 1907 building via exhibit photo and text, including acknowledgement of the YWCA building and its role in the city at 630 Linden Street and 235 Jefferson Avenue, Scranton, Pennsylvania. At this time, I'll entertain a motion that item 5B be introduced into its proper committee. So moved. Second. On the question? Uh, just on a question, because I, I haven't commented yet on, uh, on this here. Uh, Mrs. Evans has stated the reason why we're tabling it. And also, it hasn't been before the zoning board yet either. I believe that's two weeks away. Mm -hmm. um, for us to approve something before the zoning board is. Well, I would I recommend know. approval in terms of introduction. Yes, oh, definitely. That, and then a tabling I'm, I'm, until. Don't get me wrong. I'm in favor of this building. I think it's, it's going to be an asset to the area. Um, but again, we have to do things the right way. I've been probably the most critical here. Well, one of the most critical about uh, different things at the university. It's no secret. Um, tax exempt properties and stuff like that. But uh, the thing is, I mean, th this is already a tax exempt property, which I have no problem with. I will be more critical at looking in the future at future development that encroaches out of the institutional zone in taxable areas. Um, you know, we had a very good meeting several years ago up at the university, and it was portrayed the wrong way by the, the news media. And, uh, you know, I still remember that. All we were trying to do was be fair to the citizens of this city, the taxpayers. The taxpayers who have seen the university's property double in the last 12 years, which is fine. They're doing a beautiful job. But again, it's still on the back of the taxpayers. Think you can read all the literature that shows the economic impact, but we've still been distressed since 1992. That impact hasn't benefited us totally. Not that there isn't a benefit. I'm just going to say it like it is, you know? I mean, uh, what are we, we're receiving $175,000 now in lieu of taxes. You know, I still remember a, pro a property that was purchased for $27,000 in a court, which is out of the institution zone there, and the university purchased it for $550,000 and tore it down. I mean, you know, this is the kind of stuff that, that, that upsets me to a degree that I am critical about. Because a lot of average people don't have that kind of money to buy a property to tear down. Are we still on the question here? Yes. Doesn't seem to be. Well, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm referring to my beliefs as to why I'm. I'm sorry, Mr. McGough, if I offended you, but uh, that's where I stand. I believe this is a worthwhile project. It's a good project. But I am going to say that future expansion out of the institutional zone will be looked at critically by me. Now, I may be a minority. I probably will be a minority. But I'm here at the behest of the 70,000 taxpayers in this city. But I am for this project. And uh, everybody knows where I'm coming from. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And um, I'll just comment very briefly. I've listened carefully to our solicitor's comments 
throughout the last several years regarding, um, I think, the, the initial growth of the University of Scranton. And perhaps a bit of information tonight that was um, vocalized was not exactly accurate. And that in the beginning, the properties and the homes in the hill section that were taken for the University of Scranton's expansion, they were not blighted homes. They were not uh, homes that should have been torn down, but the city was a very good partner and a very formidable neighbor to the University of Scranton and enabled from the very beginning throughout today its consistent expansions. And uh, as Mr. Loscom said, I think it was very unfortunate years ago that we were portrayed falsely by the newspaper and the university, the leaders of the university. And it is important to remember that, yes, we represent, just as the university represents um, a Jesuit mission, which is admirable, and it uh, educates extremely, extraordinarily well uh, the youth not only of our area, but surrounding states. We at City Council represent the taxpayers of the city of Scranton. After all, we, we do not represent the University of Scranton. The University of Scranton is a tax-free institution. So we're, we're here to represent the best interests of the taxpayer, to be a good neighbor, and to always ask the university to engage in that reciprocity by helping the city of Scranton survive and avoid bankruptcy and continue to be, in the future, a prospering, successful host city that the university can be proud to be located in. And anyone else on the question? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. I'd like to make a motion to table item 5B. We have a motion on the table. Is there a second? Second. On the question? I, I don't see the need to table this. Uh, Mr. Devers was here to answer any questions, asked if we had any, um, and nobody had any about the, um, the ordinance, and uh, now we're going to table it because we have questions. I, I think that there's no need to table it. If there are questions that need to be answered, they can be answered before the next reading. Um, I don't believe the zoning board has a chance to look at had a chance to look at this project yet. No, I I think they're meeting June two weeks, right? June twelfth. Yes, it? they would meet the day before final reading. Um, June twelfth would be the zoning. If it followed the normal process, zoning board would meet Wednesday, June twelfth. The final reading, if it followed the normal course, would be on Thursday, June thirteenth. Um, that's why I agree with, with Mr. McGough. I don't see the need of tabling it. Now, if it got to seventh order and there were questions that were unanswered at that point, I, I would support well, tabling it as well. It's a, it's, a it's a resolution, so there would be only one further reading. But I had been contacted by members of HARP who felt uh, that what they had agreed to in terms of the university's plan is not what has been represented in the legislation and they would like the opportunity to look at this again and provide legislation that is indeed correct before we pass it. Then why wasn't anybody from HARB here to contest it? I don't know. Perhaps you can call and ask them. Well, you're, you're the one that's stating that they were, and. Uh, Anyone else? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. No. The ayes have it and so moved. Sixth order, no business at this time. 
Seventh order, no business at this time. If there's no further business, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. This meeting is adjourned.